So I'm starting with how you classify them um, by arrangement. Start over here. You can class them by them by how many layers of cells are there? Are there many layers? Are there a few layers? Well, if it's just one layer of cells, we call that simple. If there are many layers, um, that's stratified. Pseudostratified means it has the appearance of stratification. Look at the nuclei. If the nuclei are, is, is one row, that could be a good clue. That's one row, it's simple. But if, if they stacked on top of each other, that's like, oh, it's stratified. If it appears to be stratified, but it's not, it's pseudostratified. So what I tried to draw here is each of these cells is touching that blue line, which represents, it's called the basement membrane. which is connective tissue. Sometimes um, histologists call it different things, but um, notice that this tissue is a cell-packed tissue. So you, you try to recognize the different tissues by <laughs> looking at these cells and how they're arranged. cell-packed tissue. And because the, the cells are <laughs> packed tightly together, this tissue, the epithelia, they, they act as good linings for membranes. That's one of the functions. Um, linings. They can cover surfaces. Um, they can cover the insides of tubes.
All right, so I said that for epithelia, you want to look at the cells. The other thing is, um, if you're going to be like the linings or coverings, um, one thing that you consider is, for example, if it's stratified, look at the apical cells. Those are the cells on top. Consider those if you're trying to classify it. Okay. Um, so it can either be simple stratified, pseudo stratified, and there's one other type. I put it over here, number four. It's transitional. And I couldn't fit it in any one, two, or three because they call it transitional epithelium because they thought it was a transition between stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar. So they just call it transitional. So it's kind of like an exception, so I put it in its own category. I'll get back to that. To get back to here, so you either call it by simple stratified or pseudo stratified, but then you also consider the shape of the cell. If it's a flat cell, squamous means flat, then of course cuboidal and columnar, you have epithelial cells packed tightly together that, that are in those shapes. And again, always look at the nucleus. Okay, I colored it green here. In cuboidal cells, they tend to be large and round. Sometimes in columnar, they're round too, but sometimes I see columnar tissues have um, like kind of a cigar shaped type of a nucleus. Okay. Um, oh, and a lot of times when we go through the different tissues, they'll have these specialized surface modifications. Like, for example, microvilli, I drew it in here in this first one, that brush border. Sometimes you, you see that on cells that are cuboidal or columnar. But the purpose is to increase, increase the surface area on that apical side because you're probably performing some absorption secretion function. Let me write that down. Increase surface area. You're improving absorption and um, secretion functions. Better absorption or secretion, whatever it is. The cilia, I do those little black lines on top of this one. You do usually see it on the epithelia that's pseudostratified. It's for beating. Okay, and I think I had mentioned that previously, chapter three. A keratinizing uh, epithelium will have all these layers of dead cells on it, dead cells that are filled with keratin. And you usually see it on epithelia that are stratified like this one. So if I put like a few layers of dead cells on it, we, we could kind of refer to that as keratin. The function of it, like for example in skin, this is the example we use as a keratinizing tissue, it's for waterproofing. Um, so the, the last thing here is, a transitional epithelia, the, the exception. We can clearly see the cells here are kind of cuboidal and they're stratified, but you, we don't call it stratified cuboidal. The correct um, labeling is transitional. Okay. And the example this is from, this is the epithelium that lines the urinary tract, for example, the bladder, yeah. urinary bladder. Transitional epithelium, this is the only place where we study it in the urinary tract. So for example, if your bladder is empty, <coughs> uh, I mean, we're just looking at a, a simple, like for example, the bladder is like, looks like this. And let's say the lining of the bladder
like that. And so we're just looking at like just a little snippet of urinary bladder. Let's say, let's say your bladder is empty and it's kind of shrunken. And so this epithelial tissue, that's why it's taller here because the bladder is empty and it's kind of like all, um, it's not stretched out. But if, as the bladder fills, Um, I'm not going to draw here. Ooh, let me exaggerate. Obviously, your bladder doesn't get that big. But the, the, the epithelium with a full bladder, about a liter of urine in there, the epithelium will stretch out. It'll be stretched really tight because the bladder is full of urine. Bladder. And so when you look at the, uh, the epithelial tissue, if you just look at a little bit of it, it's like more flattened because it's, the bladder is full. So um, we'll look at that later. Let's move on. Now when you name these tissues, always put first if it's simple stratified or Pseudostratified. Then put if it's squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. Then put epithelial tissue, and also add if there's any surface modification. Can you give me an example? Of how to name it? Always put category one. Is it simple, stratified, whatever? If it's simple, put simple. Then put the shape. Maybe it's cuboidal. Then put epithelial tissue. I'll, re I'll abbreviate it in this lecture, ET, just for brevity's sake. But that's how you do it. Boom, boom, and then boom, the tissue type. You always put that. Let's say there's a surface modification. Let's say, like over there, there's um, a microvilli brush border. You're expected to identify that and see it and put it. And so you'd say, um, with microvilli brush border. Let's say it's a ciliated tissue. A lot of times, they'll lead with that. They'll put the surface modification first. So they'll put ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar, ET. Or the keratinizing specialized modification. That's also put first. Keratinizing. The more I put the keratin on that first one, I said it was, what's the next word I'm going to put for this tissue? After keratinizing, what word should I put? Stratified, then what? Always look at the apical cells. More or less squamous, then epithelial tissue. Get it out of order. You know, points will be deducted. They're not named that way. They're always named in this way. You know, boom, boom, then the tissue type. And also, um, another function of epithelial tissues, besides being good linings and coverings, they have a glandular function too. Okay. So let me erase.
number one. <coughs> like I said there, linings, coverings. Number two, glandular. The glandular function means it's a tissue that will secrete things like secretion, sweat, anything that emanates from your body, uh, tears, <coughs> saliva, enzymes, and we'll have a whole chapter in 431 on hormones. Usually, tissue that is glandular in function, the cells are epithelial tissue and it's usually cuboidal. Cuboidal tissue is glandular. So we'll start to go through the slides so we can see more pictures of what I'm talking about here. Transitional epithelia. You have that binucleated top cell. So two nuclei in it. Binucleated. I don't know why. I just know I you only see it in transitional epithelium. And it's like every histology book I've ever looked at, they always like to point that out. Well, every tissue I look at from a collection, I, I never see it. But I always see it in the books. So note that you have binucleated cell for transitional epithelium, the, the, the very top layer. So if we were to see it, that's just like one way to know that it is transitional epithelium? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Binucleated cell, transitional epithelium. <coughs> now this um, chapter, Again, we're going to go through all four tissue types. Nervous, muscle, epithelial, connected. Today's just epithelial tissue. And um, this is kind of what I just got through saying. The two main types are for coverings and linings, or glandular. And um, this, the, the pictures in the book are better than I can draw, but I think it's good to attempt for you to draw it. You got some kind of basal surface, or I call it a basement membrane, and the cells are packed tightly either stratified or simple. They don't show you pseudostratified, but here are the basic shapes that we've talked about. Flat, cuboidal, or columna. Now, some other features of um, epithelial tissue that was too much to draw, I say other features are that they're polarized, they're avascular, and they're regenerative. So when, it, when you read those terms in the book, let me explain to you what they're meaning by that. Polarity. Call this epithelial tissue characteristics. Again, if you consider the surfaces, apical versus basal, there's a, um, there's a distinct organization. The cell organelles are not arranged haphazardly. They're organized in a certain way to execute its function. So let's say, for example, um, in my basement membrane, I draw some columnar cells on top of it. You. And notice in the picture, all, all the nuclei tend to be kind of a little bit towards the basal side. And usually the rest of their organelles are arranged in a way, like for example, maybe all the ER 
are kind of like arranged that way right above the nucleus. Remember the endoplasmic reticulum? And, and maybe the Golgi apparatus is right above that. So that you can secrete things on the apical surface. So that, that's, what, that's what polarity means. It's polarized in a way where all the nukes are on the bottom and all the endomembrane system things are on the top. Okay? It's not just random. They're, they're trying to execute the function of secretion. Polarity helps. Yeah, endoplasmic particular, thank you. Not to be confused with ET, which is what in my lecture? Epithelial tissue, because I do use those abbreviations a lot, so let's not. What? That just doesn't matter, just set an example. The point of this is organelles are organized to help tissues function. That's the main concept. But they're probably rough because they're probably secreting proteins, yeah, in this, in this example. It's kind of cool how the nuclei line, line up all in a row in a simple tissue. Okay. And this is a really good picture. But do you see how, like, you can see, like, it looks like the nuclei stack. Uh, don't be tempted to call it stratified. Because remember, you're, you're looking at a tissue in three-dimensional space. There's probably cells behind it. You should probably see those. But look at this tissue here. So when you look at this, you kind of have to know what you're looking at. And I do. But um, if you were to name this tissue, and I were to tell you, again, look at the top layers. What shape is that to you, these top layers? Squamous. Squamous. Do you see one or more than one? I see more than one. So you'd call this a stratified squamous epithelium. All these cells on the bottom are replacing the cells at the top, which are being sloughed off continually. So that's why I put epithelial tissue. I said before it's cell packed, but it's also regenerative because you're always replacing the cells left off on the top. It's another feature. So epithelial tissue is highly regenerative. Apical cells are continuously sloughed off on the top. by younger cells underneath, which are continually undergoing mitosis. Must be replaced by younger cells <laughs> underneath, <coughs> which are undergoing mitosis. tissue is, is highly mitotic. It's very good at replacing uh, those layers. And so if you have a, a stratified tissue where you're constantly sloughing off top layers, the function is protective, right? Like, um, like your tongue has stratified epithelium. When you swallow chips, and there's a sharp, chart of, a sharp piece of a chip that scratched your tongue and 
you can slough off top layers and younger layers will replace it. So again, stratified tissue, you see this, and the function is protection. So I'm writing stratified tissues have a protective function. And I said the example of tongue. Skin is stratified. Pretty much the beginning and the end of your digestive tract, right? Anus, uh, rectum. Stratified. Okay, it's regenerative. It's also a vascular because it's self-packed. Blood vessels can't squeeze in between them. Let me put that here. Let me add to this picture here. Another feature is a vascular. Blood vessels don't penetrate this cell packed tissue. So like for example, what a blood vessel will do is it'll send up a small branch of blood vessel, say an artery, as far as it can, maybe up to the basement membrane. So it'll stop there. And there'll be some gas exchange and then Blue symbolizes deoxygenated blood going back. So you see these like little blood vessels go up as far as they can up to the base of membrane and stop. So that all the nutrients have to penetrate, um, diffuse up to the epithelial tissue by diffusion. So all the little nutrients and gases, they have to just basically diffuse to all the cells. And so nourishment is by diffusion. of epithelial tissues is by diffusion. Here's a set of slides showing you the steps of how epithelial tissue can regenerate in, in the example of wound injury. So you got a cut. And um, the first stage is inflammation. There's a severed blood vessel, so you bleed. Uh, inflammatory chemicals are released. Local blood vessels become more permeable, allowing white blood cells fluid, clotting proteins, and other plasma proteins to seep in the injured area. Clotting occurs, the surface dries, and forms this gap. So there's a lot of things going on here. So first of all, let's understand what we're looking at. This is a slab of skin. And we haven't learned skin yet, but we're learning tissues, okay? And I see three layers here. This top layer, epidermis, this is called the dermis, they don't label it. This is the, um, the hypodermis. But we would be talking about this top layer, the epidermis. And if we were naming it, we would call it a, pseudo, um, excuse me, a stratified squamous epithelial tissue, just this top layer here. So when you damage tissue, let me summarize everything that's put there. Last one? No, that's like. Oh, this side? I already erased it. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll tell you what it is later. <laughs> Tissues are um, nourished by diffusion. <laughs> now, the um, thing I wanted to say about wound healing is.
step one, information. Okay, the major events were blood clotting, We spend a lot of time talking about that in a 431. We're trying to minimize the bleeding. And the other thing is leukocytopenia. <coughs> Those are the two main things to distill all that down to a couple of concepts. Blood clotting minimizes blood loss. You know, if you were to leave a test tube of blood just on the, in a vial on the desktop, it'll clot all by itself. There are intrinsic clotting factors in blood to allow it to clot. And in a wound, when you're bleeding, the clotting factors have a chance to accumulate to form a clot. Like, for example, if you ever cut your finger really bad in the refrigerator or in the kitchen and you cut it on something and it's bleeding and you wash it, okay? But don't keep washing it. Because you keep washing away the clotting factors. At some point, you have to allow them to accumulate so it will clot. But leukocyte recruitment is all of these migrating white blood cells to the area. And they've been recruited by these inflammatory chemicals. So leukocyte, that means white blood cell. Leuco means white. What they're doing is they're following this chemoattractant gradient of those inflammatory chemicals. I'll just say, follow the trail, in quotes. Follow the trail. Uh, of inflammatory chemicals. And those are being secreted by the injured tissue cells. White blood cells are actually white. So if you see pus emanating from your wound, you know it's infected. And that pus is the white blood cells doing their job. Uh, step two, organization restores the blood supply. The clot's replaced by granulation tissue, which restores the vascular supply. Then fibroblasts produce collagen. It's going to fill the gap. Macrophages, phagocytize, dead and dying cells, and other debris. Surface epithelial cells, this is what we're talking about today, uh, they multiply and migrate um, over the granulation tissue. All right, so the picture like shows everything. The granulation tissue they show there. Okay. The fibroblasts they show there. There's the macrophages keeping everything sterile. And there you see the bottom layers of the epithelium generating. Step two, restore blood supply. So the blood supply is crucial because what is the blood bringing? Uh, the fibroblasts? Fibroblasts are cells that secrete the fibers that are um, giving you that bit of scar tissue. They call it granulation tissue. Uh, I just call it scar tissue. And also, blood also brings the macrophages to kind of keep things sterile. Another thing we 
you see here is the uh, regenerating epithelium up on the top. Regenerating. Epithelium. Yeah, <laughs> you're just helping more. Okay. You increase the chance you won't get infected. Alright. Yeah. And your, your body has its own uh, cells to keep it, to keep it sterile. But, but some doctors are saying, no, don't use antiseptic until a certain point. Like, why? why? Yeah, there's different opinions on that. I could see why you would say that. Um, because, yeah, your body has its own. I'd have to talk to the doctor to see why they, they must see something in their clinics mm -hmm. to say this is not good for the patient. Okay. Yeah. Generally speaking, the first aid usually is not harmful. That's my thought. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my thought too. Why not? Yeah. Um, all right, so um, this stage is not much added. The regeneration and fibrosis effect is uh, a permanent affair. The fibrous area matures and contracts. The epithelium thickens. The fully regenerated epithelium with an underlying area of scar tissue results. scar tissue. So I'm putting regenerated epithelium with underlying scar tissue. The point of the scar tissue, it brings the two damaged tissues together, okay, for the healing. Scar tissue contracts. Um, healing the tissue. Of course, if you have a cut that's too deep, you'll need stitches to help hold the tissue together, right? Um, that's pretty much it for that. We're, we're done with wound healing. That's a good thing to talk about in tissues. And uh, I think the real challenge of this is to kind of go through the different <laughs> epithelial tissues and what they look like under the microscope, okay? And um, here, here are the ones we commonly do. We'll just go through them one at a time. We'll start off with uh, Simple squamous epithelium. And uh, by the way, I should go through the different ways we use these words. You could either say epithelium, which is singular. You're, talking, you're referring to one tissue. If you don't want to say epithelium, you could say epithelial tissue. AL makes it an adjective. You're describing something. You're describing the tissue type. If you want to use epithelium, but you want to refer to many, you could use the word epithelia, which is, which is plural. Or you could just say epithelial <coughs> tissues, with or without the S. So this is a simple squamous epithelium. It's one layer, it's simple. 
let's look into what they uh, say here. I've described what it is. Their functions say, because there's only one layer, it allows material to pass by diffusion and filtration in sites where protection is not important. It also secretes lubricating substances in serosa. Let me give you some examples. Uh, kidney, glomeruli, air sacs of lungs, lining of heart, blood vessels, lymphatic. They give you a, a lot of different things. Uh, let me um, just give you a few things to know based on what we're going to see. We are going to do lung tissue. Okay, so function. gas exchange. If that's the function, you typically see this in lung. There's only one layer, and so that's uh, thin enough to where the, the gases can exchange across that one layer. Tiny little air sacs, that's what you're seeing there. Um, let me show you the next slide. This is a picture I took from our lung tissue. One layer thick. Okay, that's basically what we're looking at. And the fresh air is all these spaces there. And those are called the alveolar spaces. You don't need to worry about that now. Just identify this as a simple squamous epithelium. Okay, let's move on. Which organ do we only need to know long or do you have to know the rest of the function? Uh, just do the ones that I'm covering. Okay, so I'll just try to keep it brief. It's more about identifying them. <coughs> Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. <clears throat> Aha! Good old kidney. So it's hard to know what you're looking at there. When you, when you study the kidney, you're going to see that the smallest functional unit is this structure called um, the nephron. study the nephron, you got about a million per kidney. And when you look at it, uh, it's got this capsule at the beginning, and it's got this um, tube attached to it, and it's highly convoluted. I won't draw the whole thing. I just want you to make sense of that picture. What the kidney is doing is it's filtering your plasma. So plasma goes in here. You filter your plasma, and it runs through this, this convoluted tube all the way through it. And when you cut it with a microscope, when you cut it with a razor and look at it under a microscope, you're cutting, say, in this plane there. And so when you look at it, you're going to see a bunch of cut tubes. So that's what you're seeing there, right? A bunch of cut tubes. So if I could draw, like, right next to that. Say, for example, I have my basement membrane. And inside of that, I have my simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. It's lining a tube, so it's in a circle. So that's a simple cuboidal epithelial <coughs> tissue. You know, sometimes we, we see a, a, a microvilli brush border in the kidney. depending on what part you're looking at. So you may or may not see this. It may have microvilli brush border. So look for that. Oh, 
I'll put it in parentheses because it may or may not be there. We're not sure. Right? Let me see if I see it on this one. No, it's not very apparent on this one. However, I would have mentioned the function. The function of the kidney is when you're filtering all your plasma through there, the job of the kidney is to produce urine. So you only want to excrete the body's waste materials. But all the other things in the plasma that's desirable, like uh, salt and glucose and sugar, all, all the other vitamins, nutrients, that you don't want to lose to the urine, you want to reabsorb it. Okay? So you want to secrete waste and reabsorb things that you want. So the function of this tissue is secretion and reabsorption. Now here's a picture I took from our collection. Let me dim the lights so you can see it a little better. Now if you don't know what you're looking for, you might say it's the big top to bottom thing, but you're looking at a bunch of cut tubes. If you cut the tube in a cross-sectional view, I see one layer of cuboidal cells. If you cut it longitudinally, there's the lumen of a tube cut lengthwise, right? And I see one layer of cells there. So wh wherever I point or wherever you look, I shouldn't have to point to anything. It's simple cuboidal epithelial tissue if you recognize that it's from the kidney. Okay. And I think uh, can move on to simple columnar epithelial tissue. This one definitely has a microvilli brush border. I see it. So let's remember, if you look at one of those cells, the apical surface of the cell has that folding. But when you look at it with all the cells together, it looks like a little brush border. It's really microvilli. It's not cilia. Okay. The other thing we see here is we'll see this a lot. The other thing you want to put, if you see it, is a, a goblet cell. Goblet cells are, they're, they're one cell glands. <coughs> so if you see a goblet cell, they secrete mucus. They're stuck in between the epithelial cells. So if you see a goblet cell, always tag with goblet cells. That'll be expected. Okay. So. Um, Looks like it's from the GI tract. So let me put it in terms of organs. Small intestine. That's what you see here. You know, my next slide shows a picture of the oviduct. So I'll give you two organs to know for that one. The function is always, whenever you have a columnar cell, that's a big cell. In cells that are large, that have large amount of cytoplasm, they usually have a function of either absorption or secretion. Just like the cuboidal. If it's in the small intestine, uh, the function is obvious, absorption, absorb the nutrients. If it's in the oviduct, 
uh, once a month, an ovulated egg is swept into the oviduct where it awaits sperm. And it can hang out there for maybe one day, maybe two. And during that time, that single egg is being nourished by the epithelium, by its secretion. The next slide shows simple columnar epithelium of the oviduct. So let me uh, it project it pretty well. You don't know what you're looking at. Uh, there's a lot of nooks and crannies in the tissue for the egg to wait to be fertilized by. So maybe it's weighing in here. And um, it's lined by this simple columnar epithelium there. All of this should be connective tissue underneath of it. Uh, but all of these projections are lined with the simple columnar epithelial tissue. And I've used this picture over the years, and I don't like it. I don't think it looks very good. I'll try to find a better one to show you during the lab. But that is from oviduct. This is a tissue that's columnar, but it has the appearance of stratification. You're not going to have stratified columnar. I'll never use that. I've n I, I don't hardly ever see it. Okay? I think it exists, but I'll only give you a pseudostratified columnar. Well, we see that in the trachea. There's cilia. I don't see any goblet cells, but on trachea, I usually do. So on this tissue, um, it's ciliated, and I'll, I'll put goblet cells because I usually see that in the samples I use for the next tissue. Ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar, I'll put ET for short, with goblet cells. Big long name, yeah. On a lot of your like examples, you put them like the beginning and stuff. Because you said at first like the it would be it would go from like simple cuboidal with like the microvilli and fresh quarter, so it would go like one, two, and three. And now it's like I'm seeing a lot of like three goes first and then mm -hmm. one and two. Can it be interchangeable like that? Because it makes more the sense thing, to go. The thing uh, more it has to go in order is this one, this one, this one. The other things, goblet cells, ciliated. Microvilli, I don't care where you put it. Okay. Just as long as it's the one, two, three. Okay. So you could say technically like goblet cells inside the ciliated. Yeah. Stratified. Yeah, I'm very lenient about that. Okay. Because okay. there's no strict rule for where you put that. It's basically just like one and two have to be in order. One, two, and three. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, then where, and then the surface features, if you put this there, if you put it there, um, at the beginning or the end, uh, I don't That's care. Really matter. Yeah, okay, just as long as you put it somewhere on the line, on your practical, okay. then you'll get credit for it. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so this tissue is interesting to look at. Let the nuclei be your clue. Oh, it looks like it's definitely stratified. I see the nuclei stacked up. But again, I'm never going to give you stratified columnar. I'm only going to give you pseudostratified columnar. So always put that. Very hairy. This is not a microvilli <coughs> brush border. It's ciliated. Let's look at the next slide. Turn on the lights for this one. <coughs> so look at the top. Right here, this is what we're looking at there. This is from trachea. I see the cilia. Okay, so that's the ciliated part. And um, do you see clearish cells stuck in this top layer here? Mm -hmm. Those are the goblet cells. I'm going to get you to look at it, see if your eyeball spots them. Probably on this one, this is probably the best one there. I, I see them right there. They, they're, they're secreting mucus. So this top layer is covered with a thick layer of mucus. So this is a good example. Here's another example of the goblet cells. I think I took this one because I like that one right there. But I see them here, here, here. There's a lot of goblet cells in this tissue. And 
the trachea is your airway. And it has that mucus escalator function I mentioned earlier. Here's an even closer up picture I took. So I get a better view of the goblet cell right in the middle. Okay. So I want to go back to this picture right here. And there's something I want to mention. The function of this tissue is it's a mucous membrane. And the organ that this was from is trachea. It's a mucous membrane because there are glands. There are unicellular glands called goblet cells. Cellular glands, we just call them seromucous glands. Let me point to the multicellular serumucous glands right here. All those, it's basically a simple cuboidal epithelium, but the function is to secrete mucus. So you see how there's a duct and it leads right to the surface? So whenever you see that little, that little divot in the tissue, it's probably where a gland underneath the tissue is spitting out mucus on top of it. Okay? And so uh, I found this and it's hard to see I really nerded out. I got excited. You know, only people like me get excited when you see pictures like this. Because you got to cut the tissue in exactly the uh, same plane where the duct leads all the way to the surface. You can see all these other mucus glands there. They're there, but you don't see the duct going straight to the surface. But they all have ducts that go to the surface. Is this? This is the one where they cut it in the exact way where you can see it going right to the surface. And so this next one. I'll expect you to identify all of these as serumucous glands. You can't see their ducts go to the surface, but that's okay. They're still there. All right, so I'm going to move away um, from this and show you the, the stratified squamous tissues. All right, this is the stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Sometimes they make a point of saying there's no keratin by calling it non-keratinized. You don't have to do that. If it's not there, you don't have to put that as non-keratinized. Just call it stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and that's fine. Here's a picture of it. <clears throat> Again, look at apical cells. Consider apical cells. They're squashed on the top and they're probably dead or dying and they will be sloughed off and replaced. Because if you look at the bottom cells, those aren't squamous. The apical cells are. You see several layers of flat cells on the top. So I'll give you a couple locations. Tongue epiglottis, where you see this. Function is protection.
Well, protection against abrasion. So if you if you rub against something, top layers are expendable to be replaced by the bottom layers, which are regenerating uh, constantly. Protection against abrasion. So tongue is obvious. Food is always tongue is always uh, shoveling food down your throat. The epiglottis, um, it's right by the tongue. It covers the airway. It when you swallow, it kind of goes down, protecting the airway. It's good to have that tissue there too. Guards the airway. Turns out the airway is the glottis. It goes right to your trachea actually. We just looked at the trachea. So epiglottis means on top of the glottis, literally. Epi means overlying. Here's a picture uh, from our collection. It's kind of faded. Let me turn off the lights. But even with the lights on, I think you can see the top cells. And um, because the top cells, the nuclei are flattened, it's easy for students to see that there's more than one layer and that they're all flat. So it's a good picture of um, stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, let's um, take our break. I still have some more slides to finish, but we'll have time today. So more lecture after the break. Come back in about 15 minutes.